Okay, so this is chapter four, and it is where we are going to learn how to solve higher order differential equations. We're gonna recall from section 1.2, an earlier section, what an initial value problem is. So the initial value problem for a general nth order linear DE, which is right here, it's nth order because it has the nth der derivative in it. And these are just functions. Of, in terms of x, this nth order linear differential equation is subject to n initial conditions. What I'd like for you to notice, though, is that all of these x values must be the same. Of course, the y values are different, but there are n of them for an nth order. For, so last section, we usually had one of them for our first order. So the theorem says, if all of these coefficients in terms of x's, these a n's, if all of them and g of x are continuous on some interval i, and also the leading coefficient in terms of x is non-zero for all the x's on that interval, then there's a unique solution to this nth order linear differential equation. I don't know if you've noticed, but I am using some notation that's very common in math. This upside down A means for all. I didn't use this one in here, but this uh, funny, funky looking E is element of. And the backwards E means there exists. So this means there exists a unique solution. Let's look at a couple examples. So by the theorem, we need to look at 3, the function 3, the function minus 7x, and sine of x, and also g of x, and to e to the x. They're all clearly continuous. It's actually continuous on the interval from, of all real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. So there exists a unique solution. And that's exactly what the theorem gives us. Another example. So looking at the coefficients in terms of x, we have 3x squared. So these are all continuous everywhere. But our other condition has to be a n of x doesn't equal to 0. So 3x squared equals to 0 at x equal to 0. Now, I forgot to point that out on the last example, but here it's 3. 3 is a constant. That constant is never going to equal to 0. So we did satisfy that second condition on the theorem. So here now we have 3x squared, and we can see I can plug in x equals 0. So it is 0 at some value of x on that interval. So the conclusion is there's just no guarantee of a unique solution. There could be two solutions or no solutions. So just this last thing that I am pointing out, it might have a unique solution or it might not have. There's just not a guarantee to one. That's all it's saying. These are my boundary conditions.
So for a boundary value problem, it's pretty much the same DE as the initial value problem, except the conditions have a different form. They basically can have different values for your X value. And those are my two boundary conditions for my second order DE. Just so we're clear, any of these pairs can happen. It doesn't have to be an initial condition for Y and an initial condition for the derivative for my second order DE. It could be two initial conditions from Y or two initial conditions from my derivative or a mixture. So here's a list of what can happen for my boundary conditions. So as I mentioned, we can have two initial conditions from y, or in the last one, we could have two initial conditions from the derivative, or we can have a mixture, one from each. An important note right here is much of what we know about the initial value problems, they don't hold true here. That uniqueness is gone. So a boundary value problem can have one solution or many solutions or no solutions. We just don't know. Let's look at some examples. So the following boundary value problem has the two initial conditions, and I've written out the general solution. So it is second order, so we have two arbitrary constants, and we can verify that this is a general solution, and you can do that as an exercise. We would just take the second derivative of this and plug it in here and then plug this y in here and show that it's equal to zero, that it's a true statement. So let's find a particular solution using those boundary conditions. So plugging in our first one, the y is negative two. This goes to zero. So we get, and our second condition, we can go ahead and plug in C1 here. Solve for C2. So we have found one unique solution. So our Y particular solution, we can plug it in. Oh, we can probably rationalize that, it'll be prettier. Looks like it's 10 root two.
And there's our unique solution. So same problem, new boundary condition, and here's our new boundary conditions. Let's copy our general solution. And plug in our two boundary conditions. So this is the same one as boundary condition as last. So we get our second boundary condition. This is zero. So we actually got the same condition twice. And as we can see, there is no way to solve for C2. So since there, we did get the same thing, there is no contradiction, but C2 can be anything since we didn't solve for it. It satisfies those two conditions. So any real number. And this is an infinite number of solutions. So our YP here, our particular solution here, is C1. Oops, sorry. We found C1 to be negative 2 cosine of 2x. Well, since it is a particular solution, we have to choose something. We choose any C2. We'll just choose uh, one, maybe. And then yeah, so a particular solution cannot have a constant in there. You've got to actually pick one, but that would be one another particular solution that satisfies it. Just pick another one. So these both work because there's an infinite number of solutions. Last example, same problem, different boundary conditions. find our general solution. Same solution as the previous two. And our second one, this goes to zero, this goes to one, and what we have here is a contradiction. So from those two boundary conditions. So therefore, there is no solution. That's my therefore symbol. So that's how a boundary value problem can have zero solutions, infinite solutions, and no solutions.